please pray with me. Guide us, Lord, that we may be true to you and follow in your path. Let us be one in heart with all who revere your name. Amen. Please be seated. Extravagance, feasting, effusiveness, exuberance, lavishness, celebration. These aren't ideas that we usually associate with Lent and the overture to Jesus' suffering and crucifixion. But last week, we heard the story of the extravagant, effusive, exuberant, and lavish love of a father for his prodigal son, which mirrors how God loves us. And this week, we just heard the story of the extravagant, effusive, exuberant, and lavish love of Mary of Bethany for her Lord, which mirrors an attitude of how we as disciples can love God. It is a story of incredible love and impetuous excess. Today's lesson captures a significant moment during the final days of Jesus' life. The journey to Jerusalem that our Lord predicted during Epiphany, the Epiphany season, has become a cold reality as Holy Week approaches. John tells us that Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, a place that was an island of serenity for him during a troubling time. You see, storm clouds are gathering around Jesus' head. The Pharisees and the temple authorities were plotting Jesus' destruction out of fear. But for a brief moment, all the ugliness and threats are pushed back as Jesus settles into the quiet oasis of his friend's home in Bethany. They had scheduled this meal as a time to thank Jesus for bringing their brother Lazarus back to life. And if you remember the story of Lazarus, Jesus brought Lazarus back to the land of the living after being buried in a tomb for days. Scholars agree that the raising of Lazarus was the last straw. Insofar as the Jewish authorities were concerned, John quotes their alarm over the growing influence of Jesus, which brought one of them to say, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. And so, they were active in their plotting to bring Jesus down. But for the moment, at the home of his friends, Jesus was experiencing soothing conversation, a sense of well-being, and wonderful smells emanating from Martha's kitchen. I experienced that sense of well-being during our recent Lenten lunches after the 11 o'clock service, and I hope that you have too. And into this context of tranquility appears Mary. She entered the room with a clay jar filled with a costly ointment. She knelt and broke open the jar, filling the room with a pungent, mint-like, pleasant-smelling aroma. All eyes were focused on Mary as she loosened her hair something a single woman never did in public. And then she proceeded to pour the oil, not on Jesus' head, but on his feet. In the process, she touched him, another violation of the prevailing sense of social decorum in the Jewish society of the day. And then, to bring this bizarre spectacle to a conclusion, Mary wiped her Lord's feet with her hair. This was scandalous, or was it? 
the word Messiah and the Greek version of the word Christ means the anointed. To anoint someone is to put oil on that person, sometimes on their head and shoulders, sometimes on their hands and feet. The sick were anointed as a ritual of healing and the dead anointed for burial. In Jesus' time and place, the Israelites would anoint the person who was going to be the next king. So Mary's anointing is a prophetic act that is both a sign of Jesus' kingship and its formal announcement. But Mary's act also foreshadowed Jesus' death and the anointing done of the body before burial. Scholars cannot agree about whether the detail concerning Mary's hair lends an erotic air to the event. Although I think it is impossible to hear the story today without raising an eyebrow, at the very least, Mary's hair imbues the act with profound intimacy calling attention to the tactile element of the anointing. As priests, Father Jim and I perform the act of anointing the forehead of those who are near death. And it is a very sacred and profound and intimate moment. Mary's act is an expression of deep love that those watching would hardly ignore or find ordinary her gift exceeds extravagance, for she expends a pound of perfume valued at about the yearly income of a manual laborer. The fragrance of Mary's perfume fills the house. The vividly sensuous nature of this passage encourages, encourages us to think about the gospel in ways beyond words and speaking and reading as we usually interact with the text on a Sunday morning. The word of God is living and active and yearns to be experienced through all of our senses. Most people have experienced a scent that floods the mind with arresting memories of a person or a place or an event. Rudyard Kipling wrote in his poem, Lichtenberg, that Smells are surer than sounds or sights to make your heartstrings crack. It turns out that the olfaction, emotion, and a memory and memory share closely networked real estate in our limbic system. Our sense of smell relates closely to how we experience life and process significant memories. Often when I've been in the New York City subway, I'll catch a whiff of someone wearing sandalwood oil, a scent that my dad wears, and which is a ubiquitous scent in, on 125th Street in Harlem, where you often see the vendors selling essential oils on the, sub, on the sidewalks. And when I detect that scent, I instinctively turn around in the subway, as if I expect him to be standing there right behind me. It has such a strong effect on me. Or whenever I smell the scent of cardamom, I'm instantly transported back to my days in Morocco where I would visit the spice shops in the markets. Mary's gift emits an aroma that saturates the house and the minds of everyone in it. And it makes me wonder, does grace have a scent? How does the passionate aroma of Christ's presence daily manifest in your life? How does the passionate aroma of Christ's presence daily manifest itself in your life? Yet, the whole scene with Mary offends at least one of the onlookers. Judas breaks in. Does he regret losing the chance to pilfer from the 300 denarii? 
Or is Mary's lavish love too disturbing to watch? But clearly, Mary is causing no harm, and Jesus commends her for what she has done. She alone understands what is about to happen, as she is literally anointing Jesus for the grave. We can juxtapose Mary's gift with Judas's stinginess. He is false, she is true, he is greedy and self-serving, she is generous and ebullient with devotional love. Lavish devotion contrasts with critical stinginess. This passage gives us permission to honor Jesus in extravagant ways. It embraces affection as part of a devotion to Jesus that is nothing less than the costly, precious gift of one's whole self, down to every last strand of hair. Jesus defends Mary and says, leave her alone. You will have lots of times to help the poor as you should, but this is special. Mary knows I'm about to die. She is showing her love. Mary was showing Jesus that he was more important than anything to her. The most important thing that had ever happened to her and was more important than all the money in the world. This sentiment is echoed in Paul's letter to the Philippians that we heard today when he says, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So what can we take away from today's gospel? One thing we can learn is the importance of giving. Mary gave the finest gifts that she had. Her giving was reckless and impulsive and extravagant. But what Jesus would have us learn from this woman is the importance of a generous heart. Mary gave freely and lovingly without constraint. I think we need that inspiration. Even in the face of our uncertain economy and onerous tax laws, Mary's action of pure, scandalous extravagance and lavish worship it challenges us to mirror her attitude. Another lesson we can learn is the power of proper receiving. Jesus let this woman express her extravagant love by receiving her gift with humility and with vulnerability. We need to learn to be more open to gifts that can come to us that may make us feel vulnerable. And finally, we need to remember that when we blend giving and receiving, we create that wonderful reality we call sharing. Christianity is an invitation to go on a shared journey, a journey that enriches us as we enrich others. Christianity provides an opportunity to be blessed as we become a blessing. So, as we prepare to celebrate the sacred mysteries of Holy Week. Let us remember that at the heart of it all is the simple truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Let us also remember that Christian faith without passion, without giving, without extravagance is a pretty dull thing. Jesus gave himself lavishly, generously, completely for the sake of the world. Let us dwell in that gift and commit ourselves to lives that are given wholly to him. Amen.